it was a moment not of liberation, but of replacement of one collectivist ideology, communism, by another collectivism, ideology, liberalism. Welcome back to Mind Matters, everyone. I'm Harrison Cayley. Joining me are my co-hosts, Elon Martin and Adam Daniels. Today, we are pleased to have joining us Professor Zbigniew Yanovsky, author of this book, Homo Americanus, The Rise of Totalitarian Democracy in America. This one was published by St. Augustine's Press, and it just came out recently, uh, 2021. So it is a new book. And it is a very interesting book. We will be talking about it and its author, Professor Yanovsky Zbigniew. Welcome to the sh- welcome to the show, Zbigniew. Thank you for inviting me. I want to start out with the book itself. I found this one. How did I find this one? Well, we interviewed uh, your friend Richard Legutko a couple weeks ago, and I'd found his book. I believe after reading Rod Dreyer's book. And I think I was just searching um, Amazon, as I do every once in a while, uh, well, pretty pretty frequently, and somehow I, I came across this book before it was published, and I said, oh, that looks, that looks interesting. So I was waiting for it to be published, and I, I got it as soon as it came out, and read it after that, and it is quite an interesting book, as I said, and one of the great things about it that I found, that I appreciated, was just the wealth of um, literary references. Um, I liked the the fact that you that you wrote and utilized Orwell, Huxley, um, Zamyatin, and, and and Dostoevsky, Dost- and Dostoevsky. Um, yeah, absolutely. So there was there there's a lot there's a lot in this book. Um, I want to start out by just asking you. What was the genesis of this book? How did it come about? Like, when did you start thinking about the topics that you wrote about? Was it a recent phenomenon, or has this been gestating for years? No, it's been recent, but it um, it was not something sudden. Let's put it this way: uh, when Trump got elected, uh, a friend of mine told me that uh, there was a shortage of Orwell's 1984 that Amazon made a disclaimer that the book would be published in two months' time. Uh, There were not enough copies. People started wondering what was going on, you know, or uh, entering some kind of a new totalitarian phase, and Trump uh, is its embodiment or something of that kind. And I thought, Mm -hmm. you know, I, I came to America when I was 24, and America is nothing like Orwellian uh, 1984. Uh, so that was the first thing that occurred to me. It is not a totalitarianism that I knew from Poland or you know Soviet kind of totalitarianism. Uh, now the book itself. Now I never intended to write a book like this. It was something that originated uh, in Starbucks. Uh, I was sitting there drinking coffee and was sketching things for myself. Just, uh, you know, I like writing. Uh, And I thought, you know, why don't I explicate to myself what is going on and why? And absolutely no parallel to communism was uh, something that would explain American reality. Now, I, I had enough knowledge, of course, about certain things like Zamyatin, like Huxley, uh, to understand that there is something similar. And then there was an issue of the Atlantic Monthly about democracy from about four years ago, three, four years ago, with a few articles by Anne Applebaum making references to uh, Orwell. And I thought she just got it wrong. She's a very knowledgeable, uh, intelligent woman, knows history of the Gulag, something that she wrote the book about, and yet she got everything wrong. So the uh, the question was, you know, is there another source of this 
new totalitarianism. And I started teaching students Huxley's Brave New World, uh, which is much less popular than Orwell. There is no Big Brother, there is no thought uh, police or those kinds of things. And American reality uh, started appearing to me to be much more like Huxley's Brave New World than anything like that. And from there, there was only one step to Dostoevsky, uh, his notes from the underground. And he thought he just got it right. That's pretty much the genesis of, of the book. Hmm. Well, you mentioned your students. Um, can you tell us a, a bit more of your background um, so you were a, a university professor. You moved to the States when you were 24. Right. Um, so what, just for, for our viewers and for our listeners, can you, can you tell us a bit about yourself and your, your academic background? So, so first of all, what did, uh, what did you teach and where did you teach it? Well, first I was a student at the Catholic University of America in Washington, DC, which is a very good, decent place where I learned pretty much everything I know. Then I moved to the University of Chicago uh, to the Committee on Social Thought. Uh, that was a very different kind of an institution. And uh, I went there uh, to study with Leszek Kowakowski, the author of Main Currents of Marxism. Uh, then, of course, you know, I taught in different places in the U.S., in Canada, in Halifax, at the University of King's College, which was probably the best teaching experience I have ever had that was Canada. And then I moved to Paris for two years and then came back to the US. I, I lived in Denver, then Baltimore. So different places, different situations. Mm -hmm. But uh, just to make one disclaimer, I, I, was, uh, I never wrote about political philosophy before. Uh, my subject matter was Descartes. Uh, I wrote three books on him, and then when you know political situation in the U.S. started changing, I, I started looking for. Uh, it was more intuition than interest into political philosophy, mm -hmm. uh, and I discovered Mill. Uh, was reading him, and then I. I edited two volumes of his of his writings, which were not available in English since 19th century. Mill, as you know, is known for his essay on liberty, utilitarianism, on economy, and, and a, a few other books like this, but not the minor writings. And one need to understand also that Mill was not just a political philosopher. He was a propagandist. Uh, uh, propaganda was part of his uh, activities. He was a member of the parliament. He was writing occasional pieces, and uh, you know, I gathered all all of them in in, uh, in a single volume. Well, uh, uh, on the subject uh, of Mill uh, Zbigniew, uh, you discuss a little bit about his. Um, definition of evil, right? Um, as compared to a more traditional, uh, even religious conception of evil, which uh, you, in, in distinction to that more traditional evil, you you say that uh, what what Mill was introducing into the idea of evil was had more to do with. Uh, equality and progressivism and, and social uh, equality. And I wonder if you can uh, discuss a little bit about that distinction that he makes and why it may not have been the most constructive um, presentation of the idea of evil. I, I think it's a, it's a fundamental question. I'm glad you asked me about it because that's not something that you see uh, reading meal uh, it's it's not something that strikes you uh, he uses the word evil in a very different context than it used to be uh, not some kind of a demonic force it is rather something that displeases you and if you go 
over his writings, particularly his essay on liberty, uh, take a uh, pencil and underline the number of times he uses the word evil. And it's always, uh, and it's always expressed in social context, something that is displeasing to a society. It has absolutely no uh, metaphysical connotation. It is always social. Uh, and you probably notice my, what, in one of my chapters, I believe, on Eric Fromm, whom I sort of rediscovered while writing this book, that Fromm was the first one I can think of who uses or who uh, points to the social use of the word evil, not in the metaphysical sense, but exactly in the sense in which Mill uses it. That is to say, something that finds disapprobation on the part of the society. So that that suggests a more um, Mill was suggesting a more subjective uh, interpretation or experience of evil is something is what you don't I understand. like something that has social consequences. That's pretty mm -hmm. much the way in which he uses. It is not something that is metaphysically uh, appalling. Something that uh, that has some kind of a dimension that goes beyond the social context construct and i think in the in one of the chapters it might have been that chapter you talk about how that has con that, that has had consequences for the way liberal societies have developed and for our conception of evil to the point where it's pr it's pretty much by definition if you are not um, a liberal progressive then by definition you are now evil because the only good is progressive that's exactly that's exactly the point. So there's some kind of a reversal, or uh, it's some kind of a label. If if you are not for the pro, uh, on the progressive side, then you uh, you're just opposing the good, and everybody on on the other side is evil. Not evil in the sense of you know some kind of deep tendencies in human nature, but some someone who is by definition opposed to progress. It's exactly what is evil is what is non-progressive. Mm -hmm. It has no uh, solid foundation of any kind. The same goes for good. Good is what serves society at any given moment. And this leads, this leads me back to something you said just earlier about how in 2016 you couldn't see the you, you couldn't see how um you couldn't see the the parallels to communism and what you what you understood about the types of totalitarianism right. that, uh, that you grew up in and 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 in and the soviet union but, poland. but obviously ah. in poland well well yeah i'm yeah in yeah, poland in, but in soviet, with reference right. in the soviet sphere yeah um but but now, of course, I I think you would probably, well, your opinion's somewhat changed, right? Because now, like uh, along with Legutko, he, he both of you find similarities now, but it's it's uh, it's um, it's not the obvious similarities that that like you know someone will try to make with with Nazi Germany or something. It's something much deeper on that level of the the basic ideology, because uh, on the on the on the subject of good and evil, that dynamic, I think, is very similar to the, the communist dynamic, the, the, the communist ideology dynamic, that here is like the, the historical progress and the, the progress to communism and through socialism is good, and anyone that gets in the way of that is evil. So there's that, there's that similar um, linking of morality, ideas of good and evil, with this this ism, this this ideology that the, that then determines where everyone is in society. If you're good or if you're bad, and if you're you're part of the if you're on the good team or the bad team, and of course that then leads to consequences. Um, it it can be the gulag or it can be um, cancel culture. Yeah, that's, that's exactly 
Yes, uh, and and what you said uh, raises several issues. I do remember uh, it was the first part of the 90s when I was a student in Chicago and was studying Tokyo's democracy in America with François Furet, the great French historian. Uh, we never thought of Tocqueville as someone who predicted totalitarian future, even in the early 90s. Yet Tocqueville is the key to understand what is going on. You know how it is with reading books that uh, you can read a great book at one point, 10 years later, you come back to the same book and you see completely different picture or at least some parts that you that you skimmed over that you that you didn't notice mm -hmm. and uh, so that's one thing now concerning what you said uh, about Legutko and the interview uh, and the interview you had with him a few weeks ago uh, you know I was his student here uh, as a young man uh, uh, we share many similarities and so on but no one including Legutko, who was always very critical of liberalism, predicted that what would happen. Uh, you know, 1989 was uh, obviously a moment of liberation in Eastern Europe. Two years later, in 1991, Soviet Union collapses. Everybody is happy. And we thought liberalism, uh, whether you were on the conservative side or liberal side, that didn't really matter at that time. Uh, we all thought that there was a moment of liberation. Now, 30 years later, we think it was a total disaster. That is to say, uh, and that is what is interesting. I saw three reviews of my book, and three reviewers pointed to one sentence in the preface of my book, in the introduction of my book, where I said that it was a moment, not of liberation, but of replacement of one collectivist ideology, communism, by another collectivism, ideology, liberalism. Uh, and I think that's the key to understanding what really happened. Jonathan Clark, an English historian, uh, whom I interviewed in 94, I believe, said it would be a very unhappy thing if the Eastern Europeans and the Russians were to move from one unhappy state, communism, to another unhappy state, liberalism. Now, when I interviewed him, I thought that I didn't quite understand what he was saying. Uh, you know, 19... 495, that was exactly the moment when everybody was talking about Fukuyama's essay on the end of history, right? Liberalism took over. Everybody wants to have a car, a refrigerator, a house, and so on and so forth. Things didn't happen the way Fukuyama predicted. And the question is, why? And I think my thesis in this book is correct in this sense, that it was really one replacement by another replacement, one ideology by another ideology. Liberalism replaced communism. Both systems, and I think that's something that we should emphasize, go back to the idea of equality the French-American Revolution. Unless we get rid of this idea, the world is not going to get any better. We're just getting deeper and deeper into trouble when it comes to equality. This is the biggest problem. Well, let's, let's get into equality because, let's get into equality because I think that's, that's going to be a, a controversial statement for, for a lot of Westerners in particular. Um, I know the first time I saw criticism of equality, I I, I kind of thought to myself, well, who would have anything against equality? You know, how how can, how is that even possible? Just showing like the 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 uh, um, the 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 box that my head was in, right? That uh, I couldn't couldn't really see outside of it. But 
but reading your book, reading a, a whole bunch of um, other takes, well, it makes sense, but I think it needs to be expanded on for, for, right. for people. So, so first of all, like what are some, what are some definitions of equality? I'll throw out two. So one, there's equality before the law. So everyone should be approached in, in a similar way. We shouldn't have some people that can get away with murder right. in the first degree and others that don't. Then there's equality of opportunity where, well, that's, it's kind of more of a vague definition, but everyone should have the opportunity, let's say to like, if, uh, if they're a, if, if they happen to be a minority who's really smart, they shouldn't be, um, blocked from going to school to, to, to further their education and get a, a position that's that's equal to their mental aptitude. And then there's a quality of outcome, which says that, uh, every, that everyone should be, um, everyone should have an equal outcome that, that the, the merits of the person and their, what they put into things shouldn't necessarily matter that, for example, you know, every, well, th those are just some of my kind of cliched definitions for some of these concepts. So can you, uh, comment well, they are not that? quite, they're, they're, they're not quite cliche. I, uh, the first one that you mentioned equality before the law. I think everybody accepts this idea that regardless of, to use the popular uh, terminology, regardless of your sex, race, et cetera, et cetera, we're all equal before the law. That's, I don't think anyone questions this idea. Uh, the second thing, if you think about equality, uh, now in the late 18th century, uh, the idea of equality had one enemy, and that was uh, social hierarchy, which was associated with uh, aristocratic order. So that was the first enemy, uh, ecclesiastical hierarchical order. Uh, then you have another way, Marx and Engels, who think about inequality to be a result of economic differences, right? So that's the second wave. Now, if you ask anyone, do you live in a world of inequality? Most people would say from historical perspective, there's the first and the second wave. We live in a world devoid of privileges, aristocratic privileges, and economic inequality. The system of taxation, et cetera, et cetera, equalize us all. Now, what kind of inequality or equality do we demand? And uh, that's sort of an absurd. You have the words like Islamophobia, sexism, racism, xenophobia, et cetera, et cetera. We want to liquidate inequality regarding all kinds of differences. This is what the third wave of equality is about, to uh, abolish all kinds of differences. Now, think about transgenderism. Uh, now, this is something very peculiar because it's, the, it's an attempt to make us equal against nature. This to say you're born a man or a woman, uh, and yet, those people use state means to make us equal. That's, that is what seems to be the biggest problem. That's the third, of equality, third wave of equality. Uh, to abolish all kinds of distinctions that were left uh, intact by the first wave of 18th century and 19th century by Marx and Engels and by Jefferson and Mill, who still thought aristocracy is a problem, the church is a problem. Marx thought economic differences because of, you know, the proprietors of the means of production, that was another one. Those things got equalized. We're fighting against phobias that's essentially what this is about nowadays but it seems also that in this uh espousal of uh, the desire for equality that it that there is even more going on in the sense that many of the people who who speak loudest and most vociferously on this subject uh aren't 
really interested in anything like uh, fairness or justice, but that there is a, a will to accrue more power over others. And it's not enough that their position would be um, stabilized or, or bettered in some way, but that simultaneously there would also be this oppression of those that would disagree with this, uh, uh, this stated goal for themselves. You're absolutely right that there is something, something to it, but it's like saying, you know, take an example of the Catholic Church. Uh, it is to say, only men can be priests. Now, is it a question of inequality and power, or is it a question of tradition and theology being grounded in the scriptures, right? I mean, I, I just don't see what kind of oppression does the church, the Catholic Church in this case, exercises over anyone because a woman cannot become a Catholic priest. Or what kind of discrimination do you see in the Anglican Church, which allowed women to priesthood, but they are underrepresented? I don't think it's any kind of discrimination. It's simply the way certain social uh, entities are structured, which shouldn't be subject to uh, democratization. I mean, there is, you know, we can we can talk about democracy uh, in terms of electoral system. There is nothing wrong with it. Uh, even John Stuart Mill wanted to expand democracy, you know, beyond what was uh, what was normal at the beginning of the 19th century, but he didn't think that everybody could become a king. That would be incomprehensible. A monarch is not elected. We have this obsessive idea that democracy must, reg or democratic mechanism must uh, rule our life. Are, you know, take the question of education. Now, probably the most democratic thing would be to give all students A's. But this is not going to happen if you establish, uh, you know, the criteria of excellence as that that is something that education education aims at. Right? I mean, the problem, the, the the purpose of education is not to simply educate, but to make citizens good and professional in a given discipline. Hope this this answers your question. Yes. So there there's this there seems to be this intimate tie between the idea of democracy and equality. So as you mentioned, there's this democracy can perfectly well work as a an institutional thing for the you know the changing of power. Um, but <clears throat> when you when you uh, democratize democracy and apply it to <laughs> To every every field of of life, then it starts it starts be, it starts to enter an Alice in Wonderland um, world, where as you mentioned, oh well well we can just do demet, d direct democracy in schools, and then all the students will vote themselves A's, and we have uh, a majority uh, a majority rule for for everything for even the minest, min even the smallest detail. Um, every aspect of society should be democratic in some way. Everyone should have an equal voice, and everyone everyone should then listen to that voice. But that that goes into absurd directions, um, because it, w within that example that you gave about students, it totally eliminates um, a very fundamental inequality, which is um, just intelligence or aptitude, or because some. I, I studied music, so I, I like going back to musical examples. It would be oh. like if we democ if we democratized the the symphony orchestras, then we would have a whole bunch of people who do not know how to play violin playing violin, and it would sound like chaos. There's a reason <laughs> there's a reason things work, and that's because humanity is unequal in uh, in an almost infinite number of variations, and that's what gives us gives humanity all of the, the best things in life. It's because some people are great at music. 
and some people are just terrible and some people are great in other things. And those, all of those individual talents work together to create something greater. But when we want, when we try to eliminate all the, all of those differences, it's like the uh, Harrison Bergeron story from Kurt Vonnegut, which right. I mentioned in the book. That's exactly it's what like, it is. You just bring everyone down yes. to the same level. Well, there are a number of points about it. Uh, I have no musical talent whatsoever, but I'm glad you mentioned music because it's not a, only a question of individual musical talent, but there are certain cultures uh, like the Asians, which insist on the repetition, right? And you see Koreans and the Japanese playing music so well and exceeding in skills the Westerners. And there is a good reason for that, because in a culture which is geared toward repetition, repetition, and music is one of those cases, you've got to get the key right, right? When you, when you play piano, uh, you play it thousands of times before you get it right. So, uh, you know, I am for discrimination in this sense that certain cultures are geared toward hard work and music is one of them, right? I mean, individual talent is one thing, but craft is fundamental for playing piano or other musical instruments. Uh, now, uh, my daughter, who is American, uh, you know, she was very good at math in the second, third, fourth grade and would always win contests, math contests. And she would exceed everyone by about two or three years. We're doing math the European way. You memorize, you have to calculate everything in your head. In fourth and fourth, uh, fifth grade, she would lose to someone for the second time. She would win the first contest, the second, but then she was not allowed to win it for the third or fourth time. Why? Not because she didn't win it, but because she has won it. So uh, then she completely lost interest in mathematics. And I don't think that she's uh, very good in math today. Uh, you know, because they simply discourage her by saying, regardless of whether you win or lose, you're going to lose anyway. This is the effect of education nowadays. You know, it all too well. Every, then in sports, they get trophies for losing. This is absurdity. She was on a football team, soccer team. She, they never, her school never won, but she was always bringing trophies home. I taught her how to throw it out. I said, you lost, you don't get a trophy. You just throw it out. It, 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 <clears throat> there seems, it's, there's something strange going on. Well, there's, it has to be a, a, a very strange experience on the psyche of young people because there's no reinforcement for what seems to me should be a, an accurate hierarchy of values where, where children are being basically indoctrinated not to value the things that should be valued and then to, to undervalue the things or to, to, to overvalue the things that aren't. And I think that when that goes against human nature, it just creates, um, well, it creates some mental, some mental issues. Did you hear yourself you use the word hierarchy? How many people you know use the word hierarchy? They have to look it up in a dictionary. Mm. This is the, the key to our problem. Uh, nature is hierarchical. Now, neither you uh, nor your friends are against uh, hierarchy, but they're against nonsensical notion of equality where everyone is entitled to something. This is the biggest problem. We're all entitled to feel good about ourselves, right? Losing, uh, I lost so many times uh, in, in my life, so did you probably and did everyone. But 
someone's loss can be turned into something positive. You know, I studied architecture. And at some point after two years, I decided to move to philosophy, thinking that um, and there were 117 students that year, that I was not one of the best 25. So I thought it's time to look for another profession. You know, and it didn't turn out that bad after all. That's the whole point that uh, if you lose, you can still be good at something else. Maybe your first choice wasn't the right one. That's all there is to it. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, one of the things that you uh, mention in your book is on the uh, misuse of language that uh, is so pervasive right now in the West and has the effect of skewing people's thinking and uh, even their critical uh, thinking skills. And um, th this has been a topic that we've been discussing and looking at recently ourselves in discussion with a, uh, a, another person, a friend of ours that we uh, know who is looking quite deeply into language. And one of the things you mention in your book is that, you know, when there were when there were Western thinkers, for instance, during the height of the Cold War, uh, who were able to, from their perspective and their freedom of movement, to look at communism in objective, ter more or less objective terms, uh, that there was a, um, you write, a, a clarity of vision was introduced into the minds of people who may have been partially indoctrinated, who, who just didn't have the vocabulary, uh, the, the terms, the conceptions to uh, describe what they were experiencing, to describe the, uh, the, the dynamics that they were um, embroiled in. They didn't have that, uh, they didn't have those, those language tools uh, with which to read and to speak and to think that could give them uh, this understanding of exactly where they stood in relation to the, uh, the ideologues, uh, the authoritarians. Uh, so um, can you tell us a little bit more on, on that, on, on language and how you see it being misused uh, right now in the West? Perhaps. Okay, well, uh, let's put it this way. You know, when you, when you speak a foreign language, however well you speak it, you, you always feel a distance between your true self and the one that you, that you project by uh, using a different language. Uh, it was in the very early 90s, early 1991, uh, and I studied philosophy. I started getting some guidelines how to use American English writing for professional journals. And, and it was very modest, modest back then. It was about the use of he or she. Uh, now, I came to the US in 86, uh, and it was the time when everybody would speak proper English, that is to say, using he as a personal pronoun, meaning he or she. Now, English, beautiful and rich as it is, it is an unfortunate language without gender, right? Now, uh, I noticed I lived in Canada, the Canadians follow the British usage. In some cases, the, the church is referred to as a she, right? A piece of machinery is a she. Americans dropped it. Now, it's a language without gender. Now, uh, I keep stressing it, and each time I say it, uh, my uh, English language interlocutors find it as a surprise that gender is not a social category, it is a grammatical category. It just happens. In Latin, we have Three genders, right? Masculine, feminine, and neuter. In German, we have the same, in Polish, in Russian, and so on and so forth. So it is a matter of accident 
that certain words are feminine or masculine. Feminists made it an issue by saying, no, it is not a matter of grammatical category. It is a matter of oppression. When you say he or she, you are, if you're not saying he or she, but only he, you're excluding women. I mean, this is total nonsense. You're not excluding anyone. You're just following the grammatical category of a noun that is masculine, that is all there is to it. But they elevate it to a, to a level of an ideological problem. Now, this, uh, of course, uh, is still far from, you know, this ideological uh, craziness that is going on. Now, Orwell uh, understood, and that's ingenious about him, how language can influence the way we think. If you deprive people of certain vocabulary, you cannot find reality changes. You're looking at the world in a different way. Uh, so when I wrote the chapter, and it was, I do remember writing, it, it was in a Starbucks, mm -hmm. which, by the way, should be credited with my book. I don't know whether it would make it any greater. Probably some customers would, uh, would leave it and leave Starbucks bankrupt, or my book would sell in millions. Uh, but, uh, you know, I... Uh, I noticed that there is a certain similarity between what happened under communism, especially uh, in matters of economics. For as long as we're thinking that socialist economy could be improved, we kept going. This is like one of the characters, I believe, if I remember correctly, it was the old horse that was still, uh, you know, he kept going and going and going, right? Uh, trying to, to produce and produce and produce. Uh, socialism uh, survived. At some point, people realized this is not working. What was not working was the socialist language applied to economy. There is no such a thing as socialist economy. It is an economic disaster. That is what it always was. That's the power of the language. We, we, we need to sort of see things as they are. It's the reality that reflects what's going on in our minds. It's not the other way around. We cannot impose our own notions on reality. That's the problem here. I think this is where we got um, where we are in America. That is to say, we think that we can change reality by inventing new words, Islamophobia, homophobia, et cetera, et cetera, this is supposed to change. No, it's not going to change. It's going to get us into deeper trouble the same way that socialist newspeak got us into 45 years of slavery. We need to liberate ourselves from thinking that those words mean anything. You know, discrimination today doesn't really mean discrimination of the 1970s, the 50s. If you look at the black population of the 1950s and 60s, it has nothing to do with the discrimination that is supposedly, allegedly, taking place now. Mm -hmm. Something we've, um, we've taken notice of, and I'd, I'd like your thoughts about this, is that uh, on one level, uh, all of this, you know, these phobias, the, this uh, hysteria, emotionality, reactivity, um, uh, political ideology is, you know, on, on, on the face of it, it's got the veneer of progressivism or liberalism. But, uh, but it's really, uh, for a certain segment of the population, a tool and a cover for its exact opposite. So the, and okay. I, I so, wonder what. Yeah, well, my first reaction was, you're implying that there are 
conscious of their aims. I, 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 that's something that I'm not sure they are. That is to say that they have some kind of agenda. They have a goal they want to achieve. I am not sure that that's always the case. You know, the the way you phrase it, but it's um, yeah, it has uh, it's not to say that you're wrong. Uh, it's the problem is that I am not sure this is sort of um, how to put it uh, predicted in advance. Uh, what they want to achieve. It's, uh, to me, I think it's a sort of a spontaneous movement that is moving in a direction that no one can predict in which it's going to go. Mm -hmm. I, I don't so, think that there is some kind of an agenda. You know, that is all I wanted to say, that uh, we, we have a tendency to think that there is the big brother you know, the party, the political system, uh, bad boys who are designing something. I think it's, the problem is that it's spontaneous, unpredictable. Hmm. Well, and, and complex too. I think that, that when there are movements like that, spontaneous movements, then you get all kinds of different people involved. And then you get some kind of, some people that want things to go in one direction, some people that just go along with the crowd, some people that want to go and th things to go in another direction. And those conflicting motives just add to the unpredictability that we're, we're not sure where it can go. But I think that, um, well, to use an example, um, a microcosm, a microcosmic example, if you look at some of the riots that took place, uh, was it year, last year or the year before last, I think 2019. Uh, when they arrived have... in, in May, uh, yeah, when, when COVID started, right? Um, well, no, this this was... Well, well, there were some big ones in 2020. Yeah, but I'm thinking about, I think, like the George Floyd riots, like the Black yeah, Lives Matter ones. Like that was around April, was May of 2020, yeah. Yeah, I get... Oh, yeah, that, yeah that's right, because yeah, I, I, I'm terrible with time and, and this whole... Yeah. COVID thing has, has really messed with my, <laughs> my time perception. Say, like, how long has this been going on? But, um, okay. So if you look at some of those, some of those individual riots, right? So you have some protesters and then you've got a lot of people, um, a lot of people, let's say that hangers on or people that are there for other reasons. Um, they'll shout the slogans, but when you look at their criminal history, they've got They've got a history of violence. They've got a history, like a, a long criminal history. And so there seem to be like criminal opportunists that get involved in, in this specific example, riots, because seemingly they like violence and they want to have an excuse to engage in violence. And I think that that is kind of a, a kind of a microcosm for what happens in any social movement where you have, you have some people who do have their own selfish or selfish aims or other agendas or whatever and they can they can use the use the movement to to get that and no one else uh, a lot of the other members of that movement might be completely unaware of it and just think oh well here's another comrade right here's another person on my side right. and mm -hmm. and just just ignore all that other stuff um that's all just to say that um that I think it's it's also the complexity of the of the situation, the complexity of social movements, and the complexity of of human nature and the variety of human nature that contribute contributes to that lack of predictability when when looking at a situation like this. But that's exactly that's a very good example because no one could have predicted what would happen to uh, to Floyd, right? And yet that started something. Now, uh, all you needed is a few slogans. Black lives matter. The uh, white policeman, uh, you know, killed him. Now, uh, that's a very uh, interesting situation because I don't think that within a day or two since that happened and everybody in America saw uh, uh, how it happened, right? I mean, they were watching TV 24 hours a day, 
uh, what this white policeman did to him. And yet at the same time, uh, at all the whites in America, I, I have no uh, doubts here. All the whites in America would say it was horrible. It had, it is something that, for which the policeman should be put in prison. Whatever. Yet, two days later, uh, the wave changed. It was no longer a question of a policeman uh, killing a, uh, a victim. It was a question. It was a racial question, right? It turned around all the way. It was the whites against the blacks. Now, this is the old story. If you want to use it, you use it. And, and it was used beautifully. Uh, and as you uh, pointed out, if you look into the record of Mr. Floyd, it's not as clean as it uh, no, appears to be. So it is not a racial question, it is a question of order. And the American state is no longer in the position to guarantee social order. Mm -hmm. And it's getting worse and worse. No one, of course, wants to, to say it because it's a sort of a you know, death sentence if you say it. I mean, there are two systems of justice. Uh, we we had this uh, in the case of uh, what was his name, the the actor um, in the early nineties, um, the black actor who was acquitted. Bill Cosby? No. Oh, O.J. No, Simpson. Aaron. Yeah, J. Simpson. Yeah, O.J. Simpson. Uh, everybody knows, and yet. You know, I, I do regard American system of justice and the jury system as probably the, one of the greatest uh, legal inventions ever. And yet, at the same time, you can manipulate it to such a point that everybody knows that the guilty man gets acquitted. Mm -hmm. You know, bravo for the system of justice. Uh, but at the same time, you know, you start wondering where we are because it can be used simply to uh, affirm something that has nothing to do with it. You know, uh, racial uh, racial differences, racial uh, problems are one thing, but the system of justice should somehow function properly, and both the blacks and the whites should recognize you know uh, that it's not the right when a criminal gets off the hook mm -hmm. yeah there are there are um well i'm gonna say there are two sides but what i mean by that is that it's almost like the the linkage between rights and duties right uh, if you if you just look at one at one issue you can point out a problem with one issue and then oftentimes just completely no ignore the issues that are related or that, that are tied to it. But really there are, there are all kinds of issues that, that need to be taken into account. And this is, that's just one example is that, um, there are problems, there are problems with policing. There's bad stuff that happens when, poli when police, uh, do their jobs or don't do their jobs, but there's also problems on the other end. And it's, a uh, it's, it's much more complex than the ideology would have you believe it is. But as a citizen, you, all you want is to have, um, you know, a country in which you can walk down the street feeling safe, regardless of who the criminal is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's, that's very simple. So if the state releases its power over, you know, cr uh, uh, over criminology, we're all done. Mm -hmm. So, um, by the way, uh, if if I mean to wrap, in Canada, uh, you know, the, mm -hmm. the only city where I lived for an extensive period of time was Halifax. 
Uh, whether it was five o'clock in the morning or five o'clock in the afternoon, I could walk freely from the university to where I lived without ever thinking that anyone, anyone in Canada could, you know, mug me. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's the safest country in the world. At least it was 20 years ago when I thought that. I mean, Halifax is a friendly city where no one, you know, Canadians are not Americans. That's another story. Uh, but it's a safe country. Mm -hmm. well, Sorry well, for, being, for flattering no. you. Oh, no, no problem. <laughs> but, um, hold, hold your question, Alan, because I wanted to say something about that. Relating this to to your book, um, how do I phrase this? There's a, in that example, that city, that Canadian city. There, they they obviously did something right, right to achieve that, because there are plenty of cities and entire countries where that's that's not the case, where that kind of order doesn't exist. So. So when, when you point out the problems in the kind of political philosophies that are at the basis of kind of Western societies, where do you kind of, where do you see the, or what are the positive things that you see that have made that possible? Is, 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 are, are there, are there liberal ideas or, or other ideas at the basis of Western societies that have led, led there? Or are those, well, how do you see that? Like, do you, do you see the kind of. The kind of contradiction that I'm trying I to tease out. I, mean, I, I, I know what you what you mean, but the first thing that struck me when I came to Halifax and I lived in Chicago for ten years uh, and two years in Paris before I I moved there, uh, it was somewhat provincial, which I think is still the case, and extremely patriotic. Uh, on every second house, there was a Canadian flag. I thought that Canada was like the U.S. It's nothing like the U.S. Maybe Toronto is. Uh, uh, and yet they wanted to uh, assert their national identity with the flag. Uh, and they were extremely patriotic. And oftentimes I was told that we're British without being pampas and Americans without being vulgar. <laughs> Sorry, uh, <laughs> but that is what I heard when I when I when I came to Halifax. Uh, so there is this. I, I think what made this place what I just described and what you inquired about is this sense of locality. They know where they belong. They know their British roots. They know their Christian religion. Most of them are Anglicans, by the way. Uh, uh, there is a sense of belonging, which I, you know, I lived in for 36 years in the U.S. I didn't find Americans having the same sense of serenity uh, that that Halifaxian uh, had. Maybe that is what it comes down to. Hmm. So perhaps even that you could say that th those positive aspects of life in Halifax could could almost even be despite despite the ideologies that have that that are kind of behind a, a, a Western liberal democratic society that there's there's more going on than just than just ideology. There is a sense of attachment there. I do remember a student uh, who came from a very old. Halifaxian family who told me I can die for the royal post, which Canadians uh, destroyed. It's now, um, what, what is it called now in Canada, Canadian Postal Service or something like this. He said, I can die for royal post, but not for IBM. That is how they see it. And you know the expression, snail mail. Uh, Canadian uh, Postal Service is inefficient. They changed the name before they would deliver uh, the mail. Now it takes forever for a letter to get to. So it's neither efficiency, but but there is a sense of attachment, even you know, to the old you know postals. Mm -hmm. 
Well, um, <clears throat> so we, we've been coming at the larger um, issues that you raise in your book uh, for several months now, maybe, maybe even a little longer. Um, the manifestation of totalitarianism across a wide spectrum of uh, strata, social, cultural, political, right. economic, this pervasive uh, push in, in almost every sphere uh, towards a certain line of thinking, in some places more than others. And I suppose that in, in pursuit of learning about what it is we're actually witnessing, we occasionally ask the question, what is to be done? What, where do we go from here? Because among a certain uh, portion of, of people, they're entrenched. And there's, there seems to be an almost hopeless, uh, a hopelessness about ever seeing people come to some better understanding for themselves and for, and, uh, for other people, because if they raise their understanding, then, then it's at least the hope that, that more can, can do it. But yes, there seems to be this entrenchment, uh, this malignancy, this metastasized, narrow, dogmatic way of thinking um, in, in so many areas and among so many. And uh, towards the end of your book, um, you talk about intelligence versus reason. And I love that distinction. I love the way that you described it because. Can you remind me? <laughs> remind you? Yes, well, please. Yes. Just, so intelligence is this kind of um, uh, agnostic or almost mechanical you know, RAM computer power. The, these are my words. Okay, Ver versus, yes. Now I and, do and recall. You do recall? And versus yeah, I do reason. Recall. It's in the context, I believe, of Eric Fromm's discussion, right? It, it's a wonderful uh, uh, distinction, right? Yes. But anyway, uh, sorry for interrupting you. Well, it, it was just, you know, it seemed to me um, if if more knowledge can't be assimilated by more people, for instance, and with the ideas that you present, uh, to give an example, at least for those of us who, who have um, an inkling as to what some of the problems are, right. uh, your, your framework in, you know, we can at least work on ourselves, right? So you, you discuss reason as this other faculty, it's not just raw intelligence. It's what I, from what I understood, it's this uh, capacity or inkling or tendency to want to um, augment our knowledge and intelligence with an emotional, uh, emotionally informed conscience um, and uh, an instinct that was perhaps connected to something more intrinsic to what a human being really is. Um, and, and you used uh, some sections from Fromm's work to kind of flesh that idea out. I just, I just thought it was, uh, you know, as a, as a kind of... I, um, uh, yeah. I think I, I, I know what you mean and what you're referring to. I haven't looked at it for quite some time. But uh, you pointed out to Fromm, and when I read him or reread him when I was writing this book, I thought he's just ingenious. I mean, he put his finger on something, this kind of distinction between the scientific intelligence and humanistic intelligence, which he where he introduces Pascal. And if if you remember, but this is also in conjunction with Jacques Ellul's the technological society, uh, and they're on the same page regarding it by saying that no one in 20th century can compare with Pascal. 
And Pascal is this thinker who, on the one hand, is this great mathematician, great physicist, and yet he has this humanistic approach to the world, which none of us seem to have. And this is a real problem. But, you know, one doesn't need to be a Pascal. Uh, look at your neighbors, uh, how they approach life. I have neighbors like this. Uh, you know, I, I, I am a newly born gardener, so to speak. Uh, and uh, I like to garden. I like flowers, I like plants, and I, I do it every day. Uh, what we lack, I think, or what we forgot is humanistic education. How many people in the West today study history of art? Did you study? Did you study? No one does it. Uh, museums are empty. You know, New York, Chicago, of course, there are plenty of people, many visitors to the city. They go to the museums. How many people get become sensitive as a result of looking at art? This is one of those things that should be insisted on that every kid in every year, in every grade, should go to a museum. Most museums in the world are either free or have one day where you don't have to pay a penny. We, we should encourage, I would take students or would make them go to the museum once a semester. And it was the greatest experience they've ever had. Look, before any education begins, they have to really open their, their eyes. Look, I lived in Baltimore, the blackest city in America for 12 years, every semester I would read a few pages from Sir Kenneth Clark's The Nude, four or five pages, and then would send them to the Walters Museum, giving them a very strict question to write an essay. It was the, always the best essay. The reason is they've never been to a museum, their eyes open up, they live in a ghetto, and they will never leave it unless they know that there is a world out there, mm -hmm. different from which they experience in everyday life. My students still keep writing to me, telling me that they went to the Walters Museum three, four years later, that they made another visit. You start with making them sensitive towards something. Otherwise, forget about education. You know, this is not Florence. You have to go to a museum. If you're Italian, you're lucky. You live in a museum. The rest of us need to visit a museum to make ourselves sensitive to anything. That's all mm. there is to it. Then the world is yours. Mm. Mm. It seems to me that's, that... You know, that's, uh, sorry to interrupt you, but this is what I think from thought when he thought about Pascal, that uh, Einstein, ingenious as he was, he was ingenious in one discipline, as he says. Otherwise, he was an idiot. He didn't have anything to say about politics, social issues, etc. Pascal would be a great interlocutor today. Not too many of the greatest scientists in the 20th century would could join him. Mm -hmm. So if we look at society, if we look at a healthy society, there will be all kinds of influences making up, contributing to that health. There will be the arts and history and that sensitivity and traditions and culture and religion and a whole bunch of things. And what seems to be happening today with this, uh, this rise of totalitarian democracy, as you call it in the title, is a constriction of life to very narrow bounds. Um, because, like you, like you said, um, children, young people today, aren't acquiring that sensitivity. Instead, what they 
what they tend to acquire when they do take a, a history of art or a literature class is they they don't they they aren't there the teachers aren't there to open their eyes to it their teachers are there to teach them how to criticize it to see the inherent inequalities and discriminations from the, the and on the part of the authors in what they are writing and it just it just cuts off any kind of connection to that to to beauty or to 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 truth to any kind of artistic truth that uh, that comes across and that that development of sensi- sensitivity so it seems to me that that the, the 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 young person's psyche the western psyche is being steadily constricted and confined into the, these narrow ideological blinders and that when you take away all of those important aspects of society it it can do it can only degenerate and get worse and worse and worse in the name of ever greater pro, uh, ever greater progress and one of the things one of the chapters in your book um you have a chapter with a, a significant section on Jordan Peterson and, and psychology, and I know from from conversations, um, previous conversation with you that that you're you're not a huge fan of psychology or psychologists to begin with, but there are certain psychologists that are you know that have some important things to say. I wanted to ask you about about psychology and what you think that what you think the the actual value of psychology is in this greater picture of what uh, well of human nature and uh, an, an essential aspect of humanity. I congratulate you on remembering what I said in our emails, that I am not a fan of psychology, which is absolutely true. At the same time, I am a great fan of Carl Gustav Jung, not so much Freud, Jung, who was who was a lover of humanity. And I, I think I use this expression in, uh, in the book. And I found something similar in uh, Jordan Peterson, whom I didn't know. It was my students who introduced me to him. And then I made it uh, um, part of their essays to write something about a few videos. Uh, Again, something I do not recommend students to do, but I I found him absolutely fascinating. Now, you know, I was even thinking about adding another chapter to this uh, in this book, because if I remember, the chapter you're referring to is only psychology can save us, or something like that. I was well, uh, you know, it's a crazy thing to think about. Uh, most authors would say uh, only uh, religion or God can save you. I just thought it's crazy if i if i write the chapter only god save you then <laughs> the, the liberal public would just go bizarre uh, so i didn't write anything like this nor do i uh, think that that's the the way to do it uh, why psychology I, I think we're all believers in psychology to a lesser extent or a greater extent but we we're sort of reconciled to the fact uh, that psychology has a place. Now, uh, American Shrink is not exactly what I recommend, but sort of introspection, uh, uh, you know, uh, would be a good thing. And there were some people like uh, Karen Horney, uh, uh, who is who writes beautifully. Uh, also, all uh, classical psychologists wrote very well. Now, is there a value to it? I would say a limited one, yes, but psychology has become a form of, well, that's the problem that from you were talking about before, found problematic even in the 60s, that psychology became a form of, it became tool uh, that was useful for business, telling people that they were uh, well adjusted to given social norms. Now, the question was, what are the social norms? These are the ones which serve America, what serves America, 
are the norms which are conducive to American business. And once conducive to American business, it's efficiency. So we became cogs in the big scheme of things. That was that was Fromm's idea. Now, he was a Marxist. That's a very interesting thing about Fromm. He was a Marxist. He thought that uh, society is a form of, or modern society is a form of alienating force, trying to get people disalienated to get into business. That's exactly where we are nowadays. We're saying the same story by saying, if you do not adjust your mind to politically correct dictates, you're maladjusted. Mm-hmm. And this is the biggest problem. In other words, you, I, are kind of crazies thinking that, uh, you know, the society at large is insane. We are the same ones. No, the opposite is the case. They are saying we are insane. But, you know, uh, in philosophy, it's called solipsism, right? I mean... Um, it may be the case that everyone is crazy and I am sane. And I think both of you and I feel the same way. We are the sane ones. They are the crazy ones. (laughs) Accurate, yes. (laughs) I mean, that must be the case because, you know, uh, you cannot go against 3,000 years of human tradition you know, whichever tradition you take, to say five guys on the American Supreme Court decided that marriage is not what it used to be for 3,000 years. I mean, that, you know, in this sense, uh, tradition is a very good guide because those five men cannot go against billions of people who lived before, who never asserted that marriage is anything but the marriage between a man and a woman. You know, we can legalize all kinds of relationships without giving them the same status. It's not discriminatory. It is a question of making exception to the rule. That's all there is to it. But, you know, when five people in one country in the world goes against the whole world, who is insane? You know, that doesn't mean that anyone is going to uh, use, you know, violence against anyone, etc., etc. They should have all the rights we have. That is okay, and I don't think anyone opposes it. The problem is, don't call it marriage. It's as simple as that. Mm-hmm. I think I went That's... beyond what you want. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. So when when you were describing all of that, one of the things I was thinking is that, you know, every time you you undercut one of these traditions wholesale uh and you do it across the board it it's um it kind of uh it scoops out what th- this bedrock uh whatever was stable about a particular um nation or city or people and it it makes a sp- it carves out uh a space for something else which if you know, if things progress as we see that they are, is um, is not so positive. It it just seems to uh, facil- facilitate a, an even greater movement in in that direction. Um, and I I wonder if you see uh, this this kind of thing developing that we're just moving further along in this uh, trajectory or. Do do we have enough uh, of the benefit of hindsight collectively uh, in you know in reading books as such as yours, uh, as Big Nev, in 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 other in Solzhenitsyn, in Dostoevsky, in in these great thinkers, 
uh, do we have enough collective will and knowledge and, uh, and being to make some kind of uh, appropriate uh, stand or, or line that is drawn that things can move in a more uh, constructive direction? Okay, let me put it this way. You know, uh, for the last two, three years, I started teaching Huxley, and I would organize my, oh, you're smoking too. Very good. Well, that's what I was saying <laughs> when I saw you. I was like, if he's smoking, I'm going to have a smoke. I, I, yes. I think I did it on purpose just to defy the reality. <laughs> well, let's, let's all join in then. <laughs> and next time I'm going to bring a glass of bourbon, guys. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm drinking one. No, don't, don't yes. be kidding. It has to be rinsed. <laughs> no, seriously. Uh, look, my, my, my teaching experience is a very good one. You know, I never talk about politics in class the way they, you know, other professors do that they bring in political issues by saying, okay, Trump this, Trump that, what do you think about this? This is, I was not hired to teach that. Uh, they're not paying, and in America we pay for education, big buck. Uh, so I never thought about doing things like this. Uh, they would ask me questions, do you believe in God? I would never respond. This is, you know, this is my private thing, whether I believe or not. The same goes for politics. However, I would do tricks, uh, which I learned over years, and I recommend it to my colleagues uh, to do the same. To give you an example, I would uh, teach a class on 19th century liberalism, vaguely speaking, and we would read John Stuart Mill's On Liberty, you know, the famous argument for uh, liberty for a freedom of speech. And then I would make them read some fragments from Nietzsche and Schopenhauer. Now, uh, two great thinkers, uh, um, Schopenhauer less read than Nietzsche, and would give them uh, a topic for your essay, your weekly essay. Uh, please choose the most offensive statements against women from Schopenhauer and Nietzsche, and you don't really have to look very hard for those statements, and use Mill's argument for freedom of speech to defend Nietzsche and Schopenhauer. Mm. Just think about this. It's a great intellectual exercise. It's whether you believe what Nietzsche says or Schopenhauer, who was even worse, it is a great intellectual enterprise to do. So they would write it and things would actually sort of, you know, their minds would open up that maybe not everything that they heard so, that was so bad that those mm -hmm. old guys, old European white males would say uh, was bad they had some insight that I don't think that any feminist class would ever teach them. So there is a way of teaching them, but you have to teach them, you have to discuss those, those things with them. So this is, I don't think education is a problem. The problem is the administration of education. Mm. This is the problem. Students who are 18, 19, 20, 22, they don't have any fixed views. They come there with no opinions whatsoever, even if they have the wrong opinions. If you give them Thucydides, Polybius, Livy, Plato, Aristotle, that is where they discover what they do not know. It is the administration, which is the problem, which assumes that the students have opinions. Students don't have opinions. You form them, but you don't impose your views. You make them do exactly what they told you. Give them Schopenhauer, give them Nietzsche, give them the offensive statements, and then they make them argue against themselves. Gotcha. Is 
can I ask you what contributed to you um, leaving the states? Was it was the university climate? Did that get? Uh, did you find? Did you find that getting worse? Was that, was that a contributor? Um, partly yes. Uh, there was. There is no question that it's not a place where you would like to to be. I mean, uh, let's. Um, Maybe I could put it this way, you know, trying to think that you have another year to survive before they fire you is not the is not the most optimistic scenario. Uh, uh, but you know, no one in academia could te- uh, could touch me because I said something because I never said something. Uh, my way of teaching was exactly what I what I told you. Uh, and, you know, if they want to fire Schopenhauer and Nietzsche, let them do it. Uh, so I would always use arguments. Uh, and, you know, I was a very good teacher. Students like me, those who didn't survive the first two weeks. Before, uh, I, I was probably the last one in America to give them Fs. I mean, that was a normal thing for me to do. Uh, cross out the whole essay. Uh, I would always give them uh, very specific uh, questions. Uh, those who survived uh, uh, loved me. Those who didn't survive, I called them the uh, 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 whatever it was the name. Uh, there was. Uh, you know, I had 20 students at the beginning of the semester. At the end, I had uh, uh, 13, 14, 7 who would just give up and would move on and they would take other classes. Uh, did I leave the US? No, it was just a personal decision, you know, connected with my wife's retirement and so on and so forth. So, not so much, but I am happy not to be in the dean's office again. Mm -hmm. Uh, Well, just from your description, it sounds to me as though um, you weren't uh, telling them what to think so much as giving them the tools uh, on how to think, on what thinking is, on, on uh, on the processes that involve real thinking. And just as a kind of a humorous, uh, to me, uh, anecdote as a big Um Nicholas Capaldi, who writes a lovely blurb oh. uh, on, on the back of your book, was a professor of mine at Queens College. Was uh, lucky yes. you. Yeah, I, 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 I count myself lucky. I, I didn't do particularly well in one of his philosophy courses, but there was another one that he based on his book, The Art of Deception, which was all about logical fallacies. And uh, it, it, it kind of honed, it helped me hone in on really listening to what people were saying and, and uh, reasoning out their logic and, and if it was sound or not. Uh, so, it, you know, it was just interesting to me to, to see that you knew uh, Professor Capaldi. Oh, we've known each other for some 25 or more years. And Nick, is the most gracious, elegant American there is. You know him from daily experience, so you know there is no American like this. It's a, it's a pity that this country is moving in the direction in which it is moving. It's absolutely, he's fabulous. And if you didn't read his book on John Stuart Mill, you need to do it tomorrow. Oh. Okay. It's, it's, a, it's a marvelous uh, biography of Mill. Uh, beautifully written, beautifully written. After that, you have no need uh, for reading any book on Mill except Mill himself. And you've got, as you mentioned, two. You've got two books on Mill. You've got one that's already published. Uh, I I didn't bring it into the studio today, but it's a big, thick book of of Mill's writings. And you've got another one that's it, the second one is soon to be published. Is that correct? Right, that's correct. Uh, and um, you know, we know Mill 
from those few writings which I mentioned before on liberty, utilitarianism, uh, the subjection of women, that's the kind of mill that started in uh, philosophy departments. And that was the mill that dominated our thinking in the 20th century. Uh, most of those writings uh, are occasional pieces. I mean, there are 33 volumes, if I remember correctly, of Mill's collected writings. And uh, imagine that all we know is probably a half of, of a volume from the collected works. So our knowledge is extremely limited. Uh, and I try to collect the writings which are connected ideologically with on liberty and on the representative government, but which are sort of popular kinds of writings that people would read in newspapers. Uh, the second one is purely journalistic uh, volume. All his sort of weekly magazine pieces, plus his uh, writings on the Greeks and his translations of Plato's dialogues uh, in beautiful English. Uh, that's I, I wonder why no one in 150 years has published any of the translations. They are just in beautiful English. Well, when is that one coming out? Do you know? Uh, sometimes this uh, this fall. I don't know exactly okay. when, but sometimes this fall. Yeah, and and the other one is as you uh, as you pointed out, it's rather thick. It's eight hundred pages, and I did it with a student of mine, one of those who uh, you know was just a regular student who uh, who saw the light, who saw the light. And Great. he started uh, reading, reading. Yeah. Well, we'll we'll wrap up in a few minutes here. Uh, maybe just uh, one or two more questions. I'll I'll include a link in the show description to to your books as well as to the Postal Magazine that publishes your your writings, your articles, because you've got uh, yeah. several online. Yeah. And um, you were you sent me one that I I believe that you're that will be published soon, where you mentioned Mill and equality. And some of the oh, things right. that we've talked about today. Right. And one of the things that you point out that I found interesting is, is um, some of Mill's actual ideas about democracy. You alluded to them already in this conversation. For example, mm -hmm. he, I think you even say in the article that if a lot of the modern liberals were, were to read, you know, Mill's ideas, they'd probably be like, Oh, you know, I don't know if I agree about, I agree with that because he was basically saying, well, we should expand suffrage, like people, more people should be able to vote, but there should be standards for who can vote. Like you should have a certain level of education. Right. Um, there are certain people that shouldn't be allowed to vote. And um, so on the one hand, Mill was, as you point out in your, in your articles and in, in the introduction to the, to the volume on Mill, um, on the one hand, Mill was, was like a, a radical progressive, but on the other hand, he, he retained some, some, um, what would I call them? Limits. Common, common, yeah, common sense limits to, to yeah. that sort of thing. So how do you see what has happened since Mill's time? Do you see this as the natural progression of Mill's ideas, or do you see it as uh, a deviation away from his, his, some of his more common sense ideas, or maybe both? Well, uh, you know, as I pointed out in this piece, uh, those two waves uh, uh, of equality. Uh, it's one thing, you know, to say hierarchical, aristocratic, ecclesiastical order limits some people's access to goods. Uh, that's one problem. Let's abolish it. And that was Mill's uh, idea that those kind of limitations shouldn't uh, obtain. Uh, then you have Marx and Engels who say, well, there is a problem with 
private means of production and exploitation, let's abolish it. Uh, what else can you expect? Uh, you know, our world is not the world in which we expect the abolition of private property. Uh, that's essentially has, um, you know, changed through taxation system. That is to say, you can have private enterprise, but you will be taxed. Uh, the church aristocracy exercises zero influence on your life. Uh, the fight is about something else. And I think Mill, what, what you said, commonsensical. In 19th century understanding, Mill's understanding, what we call common sense, uh, wouldn't fly. That is to say, Mill was not progressive the way we think we are. Uh, in which case, the question is, would Mill be classified as a liberal today, and the answer would uh, is absolutely not. He would be considered to be a fascist. I don't want to use the word conservative because Mill was not for conserving, conserving much, but he would be called a fascist. You are telling me that I do not uh, that I am not entitled to some things. Uh, now uh, there are a number of things that Mill. Uh, was against the first thing that uh, that you find in him okay education should be expanded to everyone but that doesn't mean that education should be free for everyone parents should contribute something in proportion to their income the second thing uh, unemployment benefits uh, that's a modern idea but there were church charities that people would receive, but they couldn't receive them indefinitely. Mill established about four to five years. If you're constantly on charity uh, support, then you lose a right to vote. So there are a number of restrictions that seem to be very reasonable. And one thing that he says very clearly that no one who lives of another person's uh, means should be eligible to vote. Now, we have, uh, you know, many states in the United States uh, want to make criminals uh, eligible to vote. Uh, Mill was against it. So there are a number of restrictions which we should just go back to revisit. Uh, the same goes for. Um, things like child support. Mill is, uh, there are a number of pages in on the representative government or the ap um, applications to on liberty, where he says, if you're bringing a child into the world, you are responsible for this child. You wouldn't have in million society a girl who is unmarried bringing into the world four or five children being on state support. He would never condone that. So I think this is the answer to your question. How far would Mill go? Your child is your responsibility. Education of your child is your responsibility. If you happen to be, if you happen to be Without means, then society should help you, but it should never become a rule. Yep, fascist. <laughs> fascist, yes, that's exactly what it is. So, you know, uh, if, if, if there is a word for it, it's uh, illiberal liberalism. Mm. Mm -hmm. it's, not, it's not liberal in our sense of the world. Uh, I mean, there's, a, you know, you ask him, is it a, uh, in a sense, of course, it is Mill's fault, but in a very restricted sense. I mean, you, uh, you know, Marx was not for building the gulag. Uh, Mill was not for building the society in which we lived, all those crazies. They are not necessarily Mill's children. 
-hmm. But there is a responsibility that he has to take or the doctrine has to take for where we are today. Great. Any final questions from you guys? I've, otherwise, I think that was a great, a great point to, to end it on. So, well, thank you, Zbigniew. It's been a great hour and 40 thank minutes. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. And keep smoking. Encourage people, <laughs> uh, you know, not to encourage people to smoke, but encourage people to defy the common standards. I mean, think about smoking. Why on earth there are no restaurants for smokers? I don't encourage, you know, I don't have to go to a restaurant where people don't smoke. Fine. But they treat us as lepers, and that is what I object to. Absolutely. And I noticed that you've got a section on, on your book in that. Maybe it's just a page or two, but uh, uh, yeah, for all the smokers, sort of uh, incentive to get the book, you'll, you'll find a, a, few, a few gems like that in there. <laughs> all right. Well, thank, thank, thank you. So, thank you so much, Speaking of it's, Thanks it's been a blast. for talking to me. Thank you. Good night. A real right. pleasure. Good evening. Likewise. Have Likewise. Good night.